This time on Watchers of Tomorrow, a very shocking people. Hello everyone, welcome to Watchers of Tomorrow, the sci-fi critique and review show that's one of the most addictive substances known to mankind. My name is Gep, and I'm joined as always by my friend and co-host Dr. Izix. Hi! And this week it's the drug episode, sort of. It's uh, <laughs> hmm. and uh, now this uh, drugs as in like you know marijuana or drugs as in like uh, you know I I need this IV in order to live or is this drugs as in you know this is opium? It's sort of both. It's kind of opium. It's probably more akin to opium historically. Yeah. Hmm. So this might have, like, parallels to our current opioid epidemic. Yeah. Oh, no! Ooh, it could, you know. <laughs> ah. <laughs> but it also has just a weird, fully weird, completely out of nowhere, unrelated to what's actually happening in the episode, drug PSA just shoved in the middle. Yep. <laughs> because welcome to the 80s. Uh, mm -hmm. Nancy Reagan will, uh, like, stare at you if you don't have these or something. So this episode is called Symbiosis. Um, people might be familiar with it because they recently did a Lower Decks where they revisited these planets. That was that was disappointing. They could have done something there, and instead it was just a two-second joke. Yeah, it was, you know, it's neat that they're kind of, you know, in the, in the context of the fiction, thinking about, you know, maybe we should drop by these sorts of places more often, and that's kind of, you know, part of the plot of the episode. But as far as, you know, making something about what's going on there, yeah, there wasn't a whole lot. Okay, so... This was written by Robert Lewin, who wrote Data Lore, uh, 110011, etc. You know, Arsenal Freedom. We've got a lot of uh, extra stuff, you know, things they've just Indeed. covered. They, they wrote the last several episodes. Yes. <laughs> it's like, we're running out of writers. Uh, here, you take over these. <laughs> and we've got a few guest stars, so I'll just run through here. We've only got four, but that's more than usual on this show, weirdly. Yes. <laughs> Have Justin Scott who plays Sobe. Scott's pretty recognizable. Um, he's been in things in movies before. We saw him previously in uh, Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan. Mm -hmm. uh, As uh, one of the uh, Khan's uh, you know, people, yeah, right? Yeah, like Khan's like, right-hand man in there, basically. Yeah. I forget. Now I'm, now I'm, I'm not going to bother looking this up. That might not be the Joe order Jim. in which he appears. Oh. <laughs> uh. Uh, you know, uh, Wrath of Khan is 82. Uh, this is after that. Okay, so good. So he is in production order. Hooray. 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 <laughs> uh, he also was in a short-lived TV show that I know nothing about called The Phoenix. It sounds fun. And he played Lawrence of Arabia in the series Voyages. Or Voyagers? Voyagers. Some sort of some sort of thing about uh, historical people. Nice. Uh, he was also in uh, Babylon 5 where he tortured Sheridan. Uh, or uh, not, not Sheridan, Seclair. Uh, and he was also in The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. Oh, right. That's Gil Swill. Yeah, he yeah. was. Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yes. Uh, apparently, he was also in Blade. Huh. And he'll also show up in Voyager as a mm -hmm. Romulan commander in Message in a Bottle. Oh, no. He's uh, not, he's switched sides or something. He plays bad <laughs> guys. He plays a lot of bad guys. Yeah. He's got the bad guy face. Yep. It's like, I'm pretty, but I'm also a bad guy. Uh, Merit... Buttrick? I think Buttrick. <laughs> I'm bad Buttrick, at names, uh, and maybe? I apologize. <laughs> Plays Tijan. Tijan, which is easier to say, oddly enough. But uh, we've also seen him before, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Sorry, I'm just, I just saw a thing about gut stops as represented by apostrophes, so I'm wondering if the space is correct, if it's Tijan, or if it's like Tijan, because that Tijan. gut stop in English is like when you say like the, the hard, the weird clicky K, hmm. like Buck. This is also, you know, uh, 80s Star Trek. But would they be thinking about that too much? Probably not. So it's probably to John. <laughs> anyway, he was also yeah. in Star Trek 2 as David Marcus. Yes, and Star Trek 3 also as David Marcus. Yeah. Uh, we talked about him before. He's uh, This is a really unfortunate. He was given this because he was having trouble getting jobs elsewhere, and he died pretty soon after the, at the age of 29 from AIDS complications. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a, a tragic end, but, uh, you know, so still kicking ass, uh, you know, right to the end, really. Yeah, so this is one of his last uh, last performances 
and it was given to him as a favor because he knows all the Star Trek people. Indeed. But he does good. But, uh, yeah. And uh, Richard Lindbeck plays Romus. He was in a biopic in the 1980s called Joni. I don't know anything about it, but it's on his thing. Hmm. He also did a lot of guest appearances of shows around this era, like Love Boat, MASH, TJ Hooker, Knight Rider, you know, that sort of stuff. And he's later going to be on DS9 and Enterprise, like all Star Trek actors. Mm -hmm. Uh, In a... uh... Uh, episode called Dax, but he's not playing Dax. He's playing Selen Pierce. Because <laughs> the, everyone's favorite character. Yes. <laughs> Selen Pierce. <laughs> and finally, we have Kimberly Farr, who plays Lang. That well, can't be right. <laughs> nope, that is right. Langor. Langor. That's a weird name. It's a weird yes, name. Yes, I'm Langor. I thought I wrote that down wrong. <laughs> I'm like a Langolier, but different. <laughs> right. She appeared. She first appeared in the 1968 television show The Virginian, mm-hmm. and as Martha had roles in the drama Missing, also guest roles in Simon and Simon and Masquerade. New heart. Never saw either of those. Also regular on the comedy series Live In. I was in something called Generations, which we've brought up before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, those are our guest guest people. Yes. A couple of, couple of Star Trek alums in there and someone who will be. Indeed. I don't know. I like Justin Scott. I need to go back and watch Briscoe County and remember where he was now. Yes. Uh, uh, going back to my, my uh, thing here, he was only in one episode uh, playing Gil Swill yeah. in the episode No Man's Land. I'm trying to remember if I... Right, that's not helpful, IMDb. Briscoe sets his sights on apprehending the Swill Brothers while Lord Bowler is hired to capture an armored vehicle. The paths cross, cross along the way and fireworks ensue. Yeah, sounds I don't right. remember that one. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> I just tried to look no. it up just to see if, I could, if it sparked a memory and it just has a picture of two generic women from, who apparently are in the episode, so... Sure. Okay, then. <laughs> anyway, watch Briscoe County Jr. It is the weirdest western science fiction comedy you will ever see in your life probably the only western science fiction comedy mm. yeah you know uh, except for that maybe that one episode of uh, red dwarf mm. <laughs> but this is a whole series yeah. yes <laughs> so consider that but not british and a whole series yeah. <laughs> slash legal drama yeah <laughs> he's a lawyer <laughs> comes up a few times dun, dun, dun. <laughs> i have a law degree <laughs> anyway I'm just sad. Like it, I don't know. They should just have it lower. Lower Decks doesn't get new guest stars. I want to see Bruce Campbell in Star Trek. That'd be nice and amazing. Anyway, we may as well jump in. There's some, there's some drug things, this, this stuff. Everyone thinks they got the Prime Directive wrong. You know, there's a lot of stuff in this mm-hmm. episode that people, people remember. Bits and pieces. So the Enterprise is in the star system Delos. And they have received a distress call from a ship that is being hurt by massive magnetic flares from the star there. Yes, yeah, so, so, so they're, they're here to study the star, but they're like, oh, yeah, there's some distress signal stuff. So uh, we'll kind of shelve the star study stuff. Yeah, they uh, can't get good contact with the freighter because of the electromagnetic interference. Uh, but they are able to contact one to John, who's way too close to the star because they're bad at navigating or something. Um, he's exceptionally unconcerned about this situation. It's like, oh, I guess we're going to die, I suppose. Uh, you know, how are you? Yeah, just imagine, um, what was it, Tech Sergeant Jen from Galaxy Quest? <laughs> yeah, Tony Shalhoub's character in Galaxy Quest? <laughs> just- so they're all, like, telling me the uh, beryllium sphere's busted and uh, we're going to get a new one. <laughs> yeah, it's just that vibe. So... My boys are telling me we're all going to (laughs) die. It's great. (laughs) Which makes sense because in later interviews, Tony Schlieb said that he envisioned that character as stoned out of his gourd. Mm -hmm. So same thing. That's (laughs) reasonable. Anyway, uh, Data is able to interface with the ship's computer and find that their engines are misaligned. No one on the ship knows how to do basic maintenance. Um, nothing is working. Everything's just going to blow up. They don't know anything, you know. They don't want to send anybody over because the ship's going to, you know, explode. So they yes. decide <laughs> that they're going to try to evacuate the crew. After this great exchange, we're like, we could send you a replacement parts. Like, oh, 
uh, will that fix things? Can you install that? Anybody <laughs> here know how to install a replacement part? No? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, this is uh, freaking bad. <laughs> Cheech and Chong in space. <laughs> It also kind of, uh, you know, uh, starts really frustrating Picard. And he's yeah. like, I'm suddenly turning into a tech support guy. What, what's going on here? Really? It's like, Tijan, can you install your engines? Tijan's not here, man. <laughs> anyway, they uh, have problems getting the transporter to work because of interference. So they have to interface with the other ship and link transporters. So it's more complicated than normal. Yeah, this is the sort of thing that we uh, will use several times going forward and, uh, uh, usually, uh, you know, in you know, to get through some sort of weird interference sort of uh, nonsense. So the filing of transport is hooked up. Everything's to the wire because it's taking really a long time. Nobody on the other ship knows what they're doing. And they send over cargo containers. Um, guys are trying to evacuate, right? Yeah. This is, this is not people. This is cargo. Come on. So they move <laughs> the cargo out of the way because we're trying to do an emergency beam out. Your ship's going to explode. They beam out yes. as much of the crew as they can, which is four out of the six people. Well, uh, that sucks for the two people left behind. Yep. There's two men, uh, Tajan and Romus, who are in very shabby, unshaven, like look like they haven't bathed in a few days garb. And mm -hmm. a man and a woman, who are Sobi and Langor, who are very fancy dressed and clean. Indeed, and uh, they're all uh, sparkly with their kind of, you know, super futuristic, but also, you know, straight out of, you know, early 80s uh, outfits. Yes, it's just great. He has such 80s hair. Like, he's got sort of a vest thing going on, and with the hair, he could have been in the cast of hair. Like, yes. it would not surprise <laughs> me. So the survivors are concerned about their cargo. They don't care that people died. They, they're, they're like, no, 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 we don't, we don't, we don't care about this. Thank you, though. Oh, uh, I guess this may be a species that doesn't have much interest in the sanctity of life, I suppose. Maybe? Yeah, they don't consider that. They're like, that's weird. That's callous. They never talk to them. They don't go like, oh, as soon as someone in our culture dies, they, we're like, okay, they're out to the great expanse or whatever. And we're, we have a three day party. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, uh, you know, I guess it's uh, a bit more enthusiastic about uh, death in the Cleons in a, a, a sort of way. It's like. All right. Well, instead of screaming about, you know, to warn people, it's like, hey, you know, we're going to have a party. Which maybe that explains why they're kind of like, dude. <laughs> they're also very upset that they can't repair their ship because they only have two left and they're both in very bad shape. So, you know, they don't have a lot of ships and no one knows how to repair the things. Yeah. So that, this seems like a very bad situation in terms, you know, of cargo runs here. So they asked to get taken to the container in the cargo bay. Uh, Dijon is relieved to know that they have it. Sobi takes issue with this because it's not to John's as they claim, it's theirs because they were trading it, apparently. But all the goods that they were being traded for just exploded. Hmm, well, that sucks. I guess the trade was incomplete. Yeah, so hmm. somebody's contract is messed up here. Uh, the argument yes. escalates into the two men attacking to each other using some sort of bioelectric ability, like an electric eel until Yar shoots them. <laughs> so this ability is kind of neat, I think, uh, because it's like, all right, we're not having the aliens like, uh, you know, like shoot rays at people. You have to actually like physically touch people and it's sort of like, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of glowing stuff going on here, but which all, you know, looks silly, but it's like, all right, we're giving the, the aliens something other than just punching you to, uh, you know, get their way with this sort of stuff here. Yeah, it's cool. It, doesn't come up a lot and it's not it's like just an aside thing it is kind of neat to just have like oh this person has weird biology that makes them electric yeah cool so after everyone's calmed down they sit everyone around to talk about this cargo situation both sides are completely obsessed with it to the exclusion of all else mm -hmm. so it seems like it's important apparently this is because Dijon's people are suffering from a plague and this is the only treatment to the plague like well great you just brought aboard a plague. Thank you yeah. so much. So, uh, so, uh, hey, uh, Dr. Crusher, uh, you mind dropping by and doing some scans, please? So Langor explains that this is medicine. It's derived from a very difficult to cultivate plant that is resource intensive to refine. So while they don't want to deny people medicine, they can't afford to give it away for free because it's essentially the only 
thing that their planet does. So uh, an entire planet where every industry is geared towards producing this. Yeah, so if they just give away an entire batch of medicine, that's their GDP for the year. Well, that, that kind of sucks, but, you know, also dying sucks. And maybe you guys should have worked out a better contract to sort all this out. To John and Romus are like, well, fine, everyone's going to have to watch us die then. They're very dramatic. Yes. <laughs> well, I think I would be too if, you know, I thought I was going to die, uh, you know, because someone was holding the medicine right mm-hmm. out in front of my face and all that sort of stuff there. And yeah. And to possibly deal with this, you know, plague situation, Fincard sends them all to sick bay immediately. Mm hmm. So, uh, you know, please don't be murdering all of us by just being here. So the doctor finds that Sobi and Langor are perfectly fine, nothing wrong with them. The other two have a bunch of disease symptoms, but no disease. Well, that's weird. Hmm. Maybe it's some sort of invisible disease. Wait, that doesn't make sense. She's also very upset by the lack of compassion being, you know, a doctor. (laughs) So, uh, Tijan and Ramis start getting more and more emphatic about how they need their medication. Uh, They say they're going to die very soon if they're not given any. Picard doesn't have the authority to do this but he's going to try to speak to Sobi and see if he can speed up this process yeah you got maybe some disputes to sort out but you know maybe it'd be a good idea to not have the people you're going to be negotiating with you know die in the process he is able to get Sobi and Langor to agree to allow two doses to be given out immediately for personal use so not the whole thing but these two can have their meds excellent so they'll uh get the uh the red le- uh, lentils uh sorted yes. out there They go to the barrel, and inside there's just a ton of tiny, tiny pellets. Apparently this is the medication. There's also a thingy that doses out the medication. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's supposed to be super duper potent, so you have to, like, cut it a certain way using a little device that's actually made out of an automated alternator. Yeah, it's just a super tiny, tiny, (laughs) tiny amount, apparently. It's 0.01 milliliters. It's an itty-bitty. Just a little, little bit. Yeah. They've apparently just spent just years, spent years and years and years refining this process. So this small batch has four billion doses in it, which used yeah. to take up warehouses a couple generations back. So uh, this is m- much easier to transport at this point, which is good since, you know, the transport fleet's falling apart. Yeah. They do say that this isn't a cure. There is no cure for the plague. This thing just manages symptoms. Hmm. And each dose only lasts about 72 hours. So they need a lot of stuff. Yes. I'm kind of curious uh, how quickly, uh, how often these uh, cargo runs are supposed to be happening. I don't know. I mean, this is, Hmm. if this is, what did they say? I wrote it down. Where'd it go? If this is 4 billion doses, okay, if this is 4 billion doses, if we assume a smaller than Earth sized population. Say a billion? Yeah, let's say it's about a billion. This lasts for about 72 hours, which means that this would be enough for about a week for the whole Mm -hmm. planet. So you have to go to uh, you know weekly or up more often to make sure everyone uh, gets their doses here. Yeah. So yeah. So they're uh, running their uh, freighter fleet into the ground, just keeping these things going, I guess. And this is when Data finds out that the entire economic system in this system is based on these two planets trading with each other. As I said, the one only produces this medication; the other makes literally everything else and then trades it for the medication. And uh, everything else apparently, uh, you know, includes shiny outfits for the, uh, you know, narco- uh, I mean, the, the drug producing planet there um, and uh, not for, you know, the people that need to take the drugs. Yeah. So the doctor takes the medication to sick bay where Tijan and the Ramos rush to take their injections and they immediately mm-hmm. feel better. Oh, well, um, that's a little suspicious. It's a good medication. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, dude, man, this medication really hits the spot. <laughs> this leads Crusher to the conclusion that this is not, in fact, medication. It is a narcotic. And everyone on John's world is addicted to drugs. Dun, dun, dun. So Data and Riker find the complete history of the system somewhere. I guess they just had it in a book in their library someplace. Yeah. <laughs> this could be something that they might want to pull up from time to time when they get to places. Yes. <laughs> you, know, you know, maybe, you know, as part of the fiction, they were supposed to be, you know, we brought, we talked to their planetary computer and looked up, up their uh, Wikipedia ent- entries locally and uh, to get sort of a general gist of the history here. But, you know, we don't have time for that. We have, a, you know, a message show to give. Both planets uh, diverged. They were around the same, and then they diverged, and one became very technologically advanced, and the other didn't. It maintained its agricultural base. Then about 200 Mm -hmm. years ago, the advanced planet was hit with a devastating illness. Their technology couldn't figure it out. 
but somehow they realized that a plant indigenous to the other planet could be made into a cure. But it could only be cultivated on that world. Oh, that's uh, kind of limiting, yeah. So. so it started as medication, and then it was quickly discovered that it was addictive. So now there's no real trace of the illness left, but they maintain their trade relationship with everyone on the other planet addicted to the narcotic, uh, thinking that they're being treated for an illness. <laughs> so uh, we got a planet that's ignorant of what the situation, and the other planet that's you know fully you know uh, you know cognizant of it. But, you know, that's how they get all of their stuff. So they'll, you know, they keep it up. So Crusher wants to tell everyone, give them a non-addictive substance that would help ease them off of the withdrawal. Uh, Picard says Mm -hmm. he can't do that because he can't interfere with what these two planets are doing just because they think it's wrong. Yeah. So uh, it's like, well, we got the situation here. And uh, if we, you know mess with this it would be technically violating the prime directive i guess so eh just don't mention it to them and uh, make sure that they're you know not causing too many problems i guess so they're contacted by the leader of the addicted planet who's understandably desperate for their medication uh mm-hmm. picard and Riker head off to talk to everyone about what in the world they should do about all of this horrible situation they found themselves in uh, this is when Wesley has a very special episode. He goes, how do people become addicted to drugs? I mean, I know in this case, they all got tricked into mm-hmm. it. So it's not like what's happening now. But I know that some people do it on purpose. What's that Tasha's about? There. <laughs> Tasha's like, well, as the uh, the character around here that like has a backstory that's you know remotely uh, relevant to this specific question. Let me tell you about the uh, the dangers of drugs, kids. I mean, Wesley. And they go, yeah. It's like, oh, well, some people start taking it to not feel bad. Then they have to take it to feel normal. But you're a good boy. You won't do drugs, right, Wesley? I'm instead going to you know transcend reality and become a space-time traveler. <laughs> Where we do lots <laughs> of drugs. I mean, have you seen him in that last episode of Picard? He does. They, they got some good shit. Yes. <laughs> in the far future, we, we, we uh, got access to all sorts of craziness here. So, you know, it's, it's, we can, you know, enjoy our space travel and uh, bend, you know, all of reality around us as needed. It's good stuff. <laughs> so in the guest quarters, Morgan demands his people get drugs so that they can take it to the planet. You know, and they go so far as to threaten to kill Riker with his electric powers. But uh, oh, no. they'll still let him go because, you know, he's not really a killer. It's fine. He's just desperate. Don't worry about it. Then Langer shows up to talk to Picard. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she and Sobe feel very bad. They're like, I'm so sorry that these people are suffering. I think that we can let them have the medication on credit. And Picard goes, oh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want them to, you know, to have too much time off the drug yeah. because then they'll realize if, that if they don't you need it anymore. you let them not have it for too long... They're going to go through their withdrawal symptoms, and then they won't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. So they, at some point, were also infected with this thing and cured themselves with this thing, with this drug, then realized that it was addictive, got their whole planet off of it, but continued to trade for everything that they possibly needed. And in fact, made it more and more addictive as time went on. Mm -hmm. You know, hence all the uh, concentration and uh, stuff there. And uh, putting their entire planet's infrastructure towards, uh, you know, producing this uh, singular product to make it maximally addictive, maximally potent for its needs. So Picard's right. He doesn't have the authority to interfere here. This is how their entire economic system functions. And it might be equally wrong for him to collapse the economic system of two entire planets as to try to get everyone unaddicted to drugs. There's an argument there. Yeah. So, since he doesn't have the authority to prevent them from trading, or to tell anyone, or do anything else, there's nothing he can do, Prime Directive. But, if he can't do that, he also can't help them repair their ships. Whoops. I I guess, uh, you know, their uh, ships are just gonna end up failing here at some point. Sobe's very mad, because this will disrupt all of their shipments. He's like, hey, if we hadn't shown up, these things would have fallen apart anyway. So, uh, good luck with that. Picard gives a speech about how they're banned by their philosophy to not help and to never know if they actually helped or not. But anyway, let's leave. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to kind of wash my hands of this whole situation and just let nature take its course, I guess. So, uh, bye. Which, like, 
So I know a lot of people criticize this episode as like, oh, well, they asked for help. Prime Directive, does it apply? Da, 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 da. But, you know, this is exactly the right decision for this situation. Mm-hmm. Like, if you had not shown up, their ships would have broken and their thing would have fallen apart because they didn't bother to upkeep the infrastructure necessary to keep their drug scam going. Yes. <laughs> you know, the, uh, you know the, the one planet uh, providing the drugs could have had their own space fleet uh, sorted out, but they decided, no, we're going to focus more on, uh, you know, making the drug as opposed to actually transporting it. Yeah. Because we're going to let the other, you know, planet deal with all the, you know, hard stuff here. Uh, and then the other planet's like, well, we're kind of too, like, high all the time to, like, do more than a half-assed job at, you know, keeping things running here. And, you know, all our actual people that know what they're doing are kind of busy providing materials for the other planet. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, you get the situation that's just basically doomed to fail at some point. You could argue that they should probably offer medical aid later. They do that in other situations. They could come and give people the stuff that would ease their withdrawal symptoms, mm-hmm. which would be nice. But yeah. Yeah, perhaps uh, set it up, uh, you know, a uh, wait until they basically realize, oh, we're not dying of a plague. And then it's like, hey, so now that you don't figure this out for yourselves, uh, we, you know, if you want to ask for help, this is maybe the time we could actually help. <laughs> Overall, this is a pretty good, I mean, it's a bit silly of a setup, but it's actually one of the few times where they can say complete non-interference probably was the right call because mm-hmm. they've introduced a completely non-tenable situation a lot of the other times that they introduced this concept they are just leaving people like if their ships were being maintenanced okay if they had the infrastructure set up to do this if this was going to be happening for generations and generations then i don't know you might have a problem there then you have a lot more of a moral problem yes (laughs) uh you know you know maybe at that point it's like well you know uh maybe we could you know, make some overtures at them about, you know, you know, hey, maybe, uh, you know, you could get some more help, uh, you know, with this whole uh, plagues thing and not be dependent on one other supplier. You know, if you were to maybe seek some Federation membership at some point and then when they, you know, you know, get around to uh, making that sort of request there, it's like, all right, well, before we get started, we need to make sure you're, uh, you know, good to go on certain fronts here. <laughs> Because, you know, you're trying to enter into a specific agreement with us. And, you know, as part of that negotiations, we're going to be having a thing where we kind of are needing to tell you about what the situation you're actually living in actually is. Uh, so, you know, what the help that we'd be able to assist you with isn't what you think we could actually assist you with. It's something that will actually solve your real problems as opposed to the ones you think you have. This is another one of the things, too, where... Um because of their non-interference thing. I think this is the thing, because we we look at this episode and we go, this is so obviously set up to say the one side is wrong. There's a, there's a planet full of drug pushers who are basically keeping an entire planet of people enslaved with narcotics in order to mm-hmm. make them everything they need. And we go, well, that's definitely wrong. And those people deserve to be punished they deserve to have their entire system collapse because they've done such a horrible thing. But if you say that, if you say we're going to interfere and help the one side and not the other, then you have in fact just made a horrible decision to destroy the lives of however many people are over there who yeah. may or may not be as involved with this whole situation as these two are. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, there's people uh, well beyond the, uh, you know, the core, uh, I guess, salesman job here that are involved to things that have been kind of, in, you know, at this point, inherited a system that they did not uh, put together. So, you know, in effect, you know, they uh, are working as part of the, you know, the, you know, the situation, but they don't really have a choice here, given this, their entire world has already been set up before they were born to be like this, as far as, you know, how things are operating. So to suddenly condemn those people that had nothing to do with, you know, getting everything rolling and perpetuating the system, that's yeah, kind of unethical too. Yeah, so in fact, the, the only way that you could, you know, interfere in this situation would be colonialism. Yeah. You would have to come in Which, and completely yeah. remake the system's economic system, like from the ground up. 
You have to teach these mm-hmm. other people how to do things for themselves or give them your post-scarcity society. Do whatever it is that you would need to do to uplift both cultures to an appropriate standard of living. And, uh, you know, that's going to take, a, you know, a massive amount of time and investment. And, you know, if they're not part of the Federation already, then, well, then you were basically imposing your sort of, uh, you know, your own system on them. And then again, of course, that's, you know, specifically colonialism, as you mentioned there. Yeah, you've put in your own system. You've homogenized their culture to be whatever yours is. You've you've dictated what they should do, which, interestingly enough, is uh, how we would handle that situation now. And we'd think there's nothing wrong with it. So in a way, mm-hmm. it's it's interesting to show this complete non-interference thing working the way it's intended, even though this is, is strangely the one that gets the most criticism for well, why didn't he help the poor drugged out planet? Well, I guess uh, this is maybe, uh, you know, I guess providing us insight in sort of the how, uh, you know, viewers of the show are maybe not quite geared in fully about what's actually trying to be said here in terms of the non-interference uh, policy. Yeah, I feel like there's a failure on the explanation of the non-interference policy because mm. the the explanation that they give in the show continuously this is the, this is the continuous only explanation they ever give for why this policy is in place it is horrible it is a horrible explanation <laughs> they they are using a very bad logical argument to justify their their thing when there are good arguments to justify their thing the thing they Indeed. always say is every time someone interferes to help no matter how good of their intentions it always ends badly. And then it just cannot be true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, not based on, uh, you know, principle at all. It's, you know, we have claimed that all the evidence points to this and any exceptions to that, that have ever taken place, they don't exist because we say so. Yeah. So they, they keep having this kind of argument of like, if we, you know, if we interfere with this planet's thing, and we help them out, then we're responsible for how that turns out later. Which, in a way, is true. But you could also make a very similar argument to say that if a doctor saves someone's life, they are now responsible for anyone that guy murders. Which is a ridiculous argument. <laughs> well, it's, you know, the doc- if the doctor had not saved that guy's life, they wouldn't have been able to go on to murder someone. <laughs> But what if they murdered someone who was going to murder 15 people? Yeah, see? There's, a, there's one for you. <laughs> so like, the, the actual reason for non-interference is what I was just laying out. Or it's, at least it's a much better argument, in my opinion, is the amount of interference you would have to do to fix this situation would completely eradicate both cultures. Mm-hmm. So they wouldn't be their own, they, they wouldn't be their people anymore. They would be, you know, Earth 2.0 or mm-hmm. Vulcan 2.0 or, you know, uh, you know, the Andoria 2.0, whatever you want to, you know, you know, what you want to sort of model it. And like you, you could have an argument for maybe you should stick, maybe you should stick around. Maybe you should have somebody who, some sort of mediator who can come in, offer them help in dealing with the situation that they have gotten themselves into, give them some amount of guidance But like, well, Mm -hmm. I don't normally like making this kind of hardship breeds whatever, whatever argument. You are, in fact, robbing the people of the opportunity to solve their own problems themselves. This is going to lead to an inevitable economic collapse. A lot of people are going to go to go through drug withdrawal, which is horrifying, but ultimately a lot less damaging than what's happening to them now. Mm -hmm. And the economic system is going to be completely knackered for one planet but the other planet is going to get all of its economic system back so yes now you have a complete shift in the balance of power and they need to figure out how to navigate that and saying that you know how they should navigate that is pretty presumptuous indeed you know you know, so you know as you mentioned you know maybe being a mediator role but definitely not you know this is what we should be doing here 100 percent. you know trust us guys we know what we're doing because we're the federation yeah that doesn't make sense here because you know as all the stuff you already mentioned so yeah that's i guess you know that would be the the offer i would you know, propose but down the line when thing mm. they need you know know that there's going to need to be sort of renegotiation of their uh, situation if you want help like 
dealing with this obvious horrible wrong, you know, if you'd like to maybe take a restorative justice approach and have a neutral mediator mm-hmm. that, that can help you both work out what to do about this awful situation, you know, mm-hmm. of course, you're not telling people this. So you like, take this card and, you know, if something happens in the future where you feel like you need to mediate something, <laughs> let us know. No yeah. reason. <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you know, having the Federation, you know, and Starfleet and whoever, you know, attached there, you know, be in that role is, you know, you know, a bit of good they can do that doesn't involve imposing their views on the situation to bring people to the table, get them talking and, you know, uh, you know, helping them sort out their problems for themselves. In fact, we seem to do that a lot in this uh, series, oddly enough. Yeah. Huh. I mean, it's interesting <laughs> that. I, I do wish that they had explained it better because they, they obviously engineered this to be the perfect non-interference scenario, mm-hmm. but they explained their non-interference policy so badly that you can very easily critique it on that basis. It's like, well, of course, Indeed. it's not going to always go wrong if you help someone. What in the world is that argument? <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess uh, a easy uh, counterexample is uh, you know uh, from Star Trek Enterprise actually uh, in the uh, that the uh, the Vulcans helped out Earth a whole lot for decades and decades before the Federation was formed and well Earth ended up you know coming back together after you know after the whole Third World War nonsense and you know you know kicked off the Federation and all sorts of cool stuff there but it required decades and decades of the Vulcans hanging out and being all like, now guys, you probably shouldn't try to kill each other anymore. Well, that one's a very weird, 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 weird idea that yes. <laughs> also goes very, very unexplored. The, the idea that there's a cutoff, there's a technological cutoff to when you're allowed to interfere. Mm-hmm. The Vulcans have been watching Earth for centuries, yep. according to Enterprise. <laughs> like- they have been around for years. They watched all three world wars and just sat there and went, well, let's see how this turns out. The exact yep. second that they detect a warp signature, they come down and go, time we can help. Isn't it lucky yeah. you invented this random technology? Isn't it lucky some idiot is still trying to think about space travel in the apocalypse? Yeah, and uh, it's totally not, you know, you guys could maybe you know bring all this nonsense you know, to our neck of the woods for, uh, you know, that's, that's nothing to do with this. Sure. It's, it's 100%. You have reached this level. And so we can begin. Yeah. It's just it. That's it. That's all <laughs> you've reached this level yeah. <laughs> of technology and now we can come help, which is pretty random. If you think about it, because like we never questioned this in star Trek world because space exploration is the natural endpoint of all life ever. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I- you know, even uh, life that, you know, was, you know, done a, pulled a Baku and, uh, yeah, we don't explore space anymore. <laughs> yeah. But it is weird if you think about it. Why is this guy wasting what is like massive future levels of technology, even for the century that they are supposedly in? Like, if you look at everything that's going on in Star Trek First Contact, he is building advanced future tech in the middle of a shanty town that could probably yep. use some of that to, you know, keep people alive. But no, space travel, and it turns out it, it great, because, you know, as soon as you invent the space travel, aliens show up to help. <laughs> yeah, you just need to, uh, you know, generate some warp plasma, and, you know, you have, <laughs> have a, a missile just hanging out here, and, uh, you know, you know, you got this other, you know, you know, coil business going on here, and that's easy to do, and that's not going to, you know, you know, take resources away from people that, you know, might need clean water or anything. Yeah. You don't need materials that I'm not entirely sure how you got on Earth because <laughs> canonically they don't appear on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess a sort of a, you know, an aside there, I don't think dilithium is 100% necessary for warp travel. It makes it a whole lot easier, but, you know, if you want to go like warp 0.1, you could potentially, you know, uh, hit that without actually having that, uh, you know, little crystal dealy. You just have to basically pull off a miracle and configure something that is very similar. See, what they what they should get to is when, in like rare circumstances, when certain things are hit with whatever near future fusion bombs they're using in World War Three, it turns mm-hmm. into dilithium. There we go. <laughs> so in fact, you wouldn't have been able to invent warp drive without the war. 
Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that kind of sucks for future us, but uh, cool. <laughs> We've only got, what, uh, uh, 40 years? 40 years before this thing is supposed to happen? So, Well, I, I plan to uh, live forever, so, you know, that's kind of coming up pretty quickly for Gotta me. Gotta dodge some bombs there. Yeah. Uh, maybe I could go live on the moon in the meantime. I mean, even even not even if you don't plan to live forever, most millennials are going to make it to to 2063. Yeah. I mean, assuming that we haven't destroyed everything else by then. Yes. Uh, and, uh, maybe we'll be living in uh, balloon cities by that point. I don't mean cities held up by balloons, but cities inside of balloons, like the kinds that clowns have. Sure. So they the future is going to be weird on the water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're going to breathe helium somehow. It doesn't make sense, but it's, it's going to be the future, man. <laughs> so everyone's voices will be really high and squeaky and we'll all hate it because it's so annoying. <laughs> but it's the only way to survive global warming. So anyway, I think you were saying there's real world parallels to this whole the cure for a disease becomes a horrible, addictive thing that people are making money off of. Indeed. Uh, so, uh, you know, if... Uh, Folks are uh, unaware there is in the United States and uh, likely other parts of the world a uh, bit of an opioid uh, epi- uh, epidemic going on here, where uh, there is it kicks off uh, as far as you know you know all the individuals involved uh, by going to the doctor actually they you know some sort of chronic pain or some sort of you know condition where you know they're going to be experiencing a lot of pain uh, is involved. And so the doctor describes like, oh, hey, we're going to give you the really good painkillers here. Uh, take this for a while. And, you know, when it's all over and done with, um, cool, you can, you know, stop taking it and uh, everything will be fine. Of course, you know, then, you know, you get uh, a lot of folks that when they stop taking it, realize, oh, I am now living in constant pain again. Well, that's weird. Huh. I need more of this. And, you know, they go back to the doctor and the doctor's like, all right, maybe once more or maybe not because, you know, we don't want you to get addicted to this stuff. But the person's like, I feel like I'm dying all the time now. So if you're not going to help, I'm going to go find it through some other means. Uh, And so suddenly there's now a black market for a, uh, you know, uh, you know, similar drugs out there uh, that, you know, people that, you know, haven't taken all their medication or maybe... Uh, you know, okay with selling. Um, and so suddenly there's sort of the illegal selling of legal narcotics in order for these folks to not experiencing what they think is, you know, the ongoing chronic pain, but may just be uh, the withdrawal symptoms from, uh, you know, being on the, the, uh, the painkiller so long. And some of them find themselves unable to, you know, go that particular route in terms of, uh, you know, you know, illegally acquiring legal drugs and say, go for something that's a little, you know, uh, uh, more black market, something that, you know, isn't a, you know, manufactured narcotic. And so you get sort of a mix of folks that are dealing, you know, pills or, you know, other sort of stuff. And, you know, it's sort of a you know, stand in for it. And, you know, you get some, you know, sort of absurdly large percentage uh, of uh, people in the locality suddenly addicted to drugs and a specific sort of drugs. And then suddenly the people on, you know, you know, the state level are like, hmm, there seems to be a problem over here. And then people on the national level, it's like, huh, there seems to be some sort of growing epidemic here is suddenly there's people in all these counties, just sort of all sorts of uh, places here uh, in this region of the country, suddenly really looking for a, uh, you know, a particular sort of a uh, you know, narcotic here. That's strange. Maybe we should look into it. And then they look at the, uh, you know, sort of where it all starts. It's like, all right, so there's a lot of doctors in this area uh, prescribing this sort of stuff here. Well, do we blame the doctors? Maybe. Or maybe the doctors are being encouraged to uh, prescribe this sort of thing. And, well, they, you know, there's been some uh, looking into that. It's like, yeah, there seems to be a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, uh, see, uh, you know, making and uh, s- uh, selling these painkillers as, you know, a, a big way to make profit. Uh, and so, in, you know, the results of the, uh, you know, the, you know, on the uh, uh, patient then be damned, we want to make our, our money here. So we're going to basically send all this information to doctors and say, hey, this is the next big thing in terms of pain management. So make sure to prescribe it to as many people as possible. Wink. 
Uh, and, you know, there's a lot more going on than just sort of this very bare bones uh, sort of sketch of the situation. But, you know, there's sort of a, a, a series of uh, incentives here to being set up to encourage a, a you know, a, a addiction in a large section of the population that is kind of not, you know, <laughs> is generally not good. And uh, because now we got people that are you know, spending a lot of their money on, you know, uh, you know, to basically try to avoid, you know, constant pain here and the money's going somewhere. Sometimes it's going to the, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, sometimes it's going to who knows who, uh, in terms of, you know, black market sort of stuff here. And, you know, it just becomes a whole mess here. And so, uh, you got a lot of people addicted to, uh, you know, these opioids and just looking for the next fix. And that's kind of annoying as far as a uh, sociological take here. What do you think, Gepwin? This was happening like this. This was when people were getting prescribed stuff like this opioid stuff's been happening for ages. Um, when this episode wasn't was going, this wasn't a big point of discourse, right? This is something mm-hmm. that's happened recently. So it's yes. interesting that it lines up so well. So one of the things that is sometimes difficult to keep in mind is while yes, especially in the opioid crisis, there are a couple of complete villains drug corporations Mm -hmm. individuals who run the drug corporations they did this as a conceited plan they concealed how addictive this stuff was they they pushed it on doctors they did all this stuff but so many of the people involved outside of the corporations were operating with complete good intentions Mm -hmm. which is one of the things that is interesting to look at when you're dealing with medical things like this, and you could take this episode to look at a for-profit medical industry because, you know, this is a d- drug. It was a cure to a disease, and they are charging this other planet basically everything that they make for it because it's a necessary thing for them. If we imagine that it's not addictive and it was still just a cure for a disease, like it would be equally wrong. Because yeah. you're holding a necessary thing over someone's head for massive economic gain. But the doctors, the ground level people, the people who actually want to be helping patients and people and people who are suffering, this stuff was marketed to them as a miracle drug. Like, mm-hmm. uh, we, painkillers were actually not, this is not something that I know the best about. I'm going off of things that I've heard recently from like uh, various reports on the opioid crisis, but before opioids were introduced, painkillers weren't the best. Like we had them, but they, they, there was a limited number. Um, some of them didn't work as well as others. There were massive side effects to some of the things and, um, people with, especially people, with, uh, long time pain or serious pain, uh, like weren't getting as much of the help as they could have been from existing painkillers. Indeed, um, a lot of the opioid stuff was given to doctors as a miracle cure for this. Like they they work exceptionally well as painkillers. Oh, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> like I've never liked them personally because I was given them after a knee surgery and they put me to sleep and uh, my pain wasn't bad enough for me to justify being asleep all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, I've uh, recently with some gut problems, uh, you know, got uh, subscribed uh, some of the you know uh, one of those uh, sorts. And it was like, well, this is about as good for me as Tylenol, I guess. Um, so I guess maybe I should just take the Tylenol. You must have a different kind of pain for that one. <laughs> but for a lot of things, they work very, very well as painkillers. The, the problem being that they are so addictive and doctors were not warned about them being addictive. They, in mm-hmm. fact, were marketed as a completely non-addictive drug. Yeah, so uh, it seems that somebody was lying about all of that. Yeah. The doctor's like, well, we, you're the big corporation. You've done all the studies. We are going to start uh, prescribing this, trusting that you've told us the complete truth about this. Whoops. So you find that medicine as a ne- not only a necessary for living, but also something that people do to try to relieve suffering because they care about other human beings... Mm -hmm. is something that can be very easily manipulated when you have someone who's only interested in a profit motivation. Indeed. So, uh, you know, if someone's going to be, uh, you know, uh, know, has an opportunity to make a lot of money, say, by getting people actually addicted to a substance, you know, if they have, you know, no moral qualms about that, they're going to do it. 
and you know they'll uh, you know lie and you know push and do what they need to in order to get you know out the door and soon enough they're making bundles and we can talk a lot about this there's there's way too much to cover in any given episode on the interplay between the american drug companies making money and the way that they interact with american medicine there's just mm-hmm. that it's a completely broken system for drug manufacture they don't they don't produce useful drugs because they'd be too cheap um yep <laughs> they full on invent new diseases to market drugs too they they will be involved in in committees that come up with new diseases especially once you get into like psychiatric medication they will full on yes. invent <laughs> new categories of disease because they have a drug they're trying to sell people i'm suddenly reminded of uh kids of the hall brain candy uh where they're like well uh we got a a, a new pill here that you know uh you know, so what does it do? Well, it's just like the the old one that we made a lot of money on. Well, that's good. Uh, does it cure anything new? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, until you come up with something for it to cure, we're, we're going to move on. <laughs> so, drug companies definitely, um, definitely not to be trusted on this sort of thing. Really. <laughs> yes, I, I guess maybe a rule, a general rule of thumb about uh, uh, large corporations if they're uh, large enough to have. A, uh, a massive uh, advertising campaign for something for a condition that you've never heard of. They maybe not might not be the most trustworthy people out there. Combining this with the outside benevolent force thing that they have with the non-interference argument, they they were never going to do this. They set this up for their non-interference argument. They created an obvious bad situation that everyone could agree with, and they tried to use it to justify their prime directive stuff in a way that they didn't explain well enough for it to function. That's yeah. the episode. <laughs> Surprise, that's it. <laughs> you could have used this to critique capitalist incentives in medicine. They didn't, but you could. Mm-hmm. Because you have a economic ruling class that is doing nothing but producing this ultimately unnecessary pill. And mm-hmm. literally everyone else. And even if we make the assumption, it would work better in some ways if they weren't just evil. It would work better in a lot of ways if this was a life-giving medication that was necessary for these people to continue to survive. Because then you have one culture that is providing a necessary life-giving resource, but they are using it to exploit the other culture for everything they have. Yeah, yeah, would, uh, yeah that I think would be a more, I guess, useful sort of episode here uh, than the one we got. Uh, you know, as is, it's like, well, we need a drug PSA, so we'll use that. Yeah, because this could have been like right now, they have no moral qualms, particularly about leaving the situation as is. The fleet's going to break mm-hmm. down, the drug trade's going to stop, the one planet's going to detox, everything's going to ultimately turn out pretty fine. There'll be a massive yeah. economic collapse on one side. Uh, we don't know how that's going to turn out for them, but overall, nothing that bad's going to happen. But if you show up to this place, you disagree with what they're doing. But if their fleet collapses, this one side stops getting life-saving medication. And yes, the other side is definitely being exploitive to such an absurd degree that the other planet is barely functioning as anything more than slave labor. But Mm -hmm. they're still being kept alive. And if you interfere, you might disrupt that. You could kill everyone on the one planet and completely destroy the economic system of the other. So, you know, a little bit more stakes here is for terms of, you know, interference uh, sort of uh, you know, outcomes. And that gets into your weird incent- incentives, especially when you're coming from a place that supposedly the Federation is coming from in Star Trek of not needing this sort of incentive anymore. They help mm-hmm. people because they want to. They have enough resources that they don't have to worry that much about it. They can Indeed. produce medications near endlessly. And in the few instances in which they can't, they just do that because they don't really need to do anything else. They don't need to exploit people for resources. They already have everything they want. Indeed. Yeah, we do have episodes later. It's like, well, we have to get some sort of special thing majig to whatever play, uh, planet. But usually it's like, we already have it. We just need to get where it needs to be. <laughs> but, you know, as I've said many times before, this is the 80s. We're not critiquing capitalism yet. Yes. <laughs> it's not allowed uh 
It's still Reaganomics time. Mm. In fact, this the problem isn't capitalism. The problem is these two evil drug pushers. Specifically. <laughs> and don't you po- dare think about anything uh, uh, wider ranging than just these two stand-ins. For, you know. They never even discuss what's going to happen to the other planet because you, you've got these two douchebags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would have been an uh, a improvement to the episode if they had, you know, changed nothing other than add a little bit. It's like, you know, Picard, if you do tell them, you know, it's going to basically ruin our planet. So, you know, please don't. And then Picard like, oh, we don't have an non-interference thing. And, you know, do that sort of stuff there. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, just sort of have that sort of come back a, a few times throughout the episode. Um, you know, there's sort of, I guess, hinting of that, but you know, yeah, they don't come to him and say, our people are going to go hungry. Millions will starve. There will be Mm -hmm. chaos. And you, what you're taking, like what you're saying is that the other planet will just like go through detox. Like they're fine. They're all alive. What you're doing is going to kill millions of people on our world. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, know, that might've been something maybe tossed at the end, you know, and, uh, you know, if they happen to do this in front of the other dudes, yeah, you know, that might be sort of a uh, get them thinking and sort of like, huh, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> I thought this was about us not dying. <laughs> you could even have a turnaround. They could go like, well, maybe you could trade us something for food. Yeah. <laughs> maybe we could make this drug not have such horrible withdrawal symptoms and then you could just use it recreationally. Exactly. Yeah, and... Uh, so as opposed to being uh, dependent upon it, you know, it's, you know, a pastime. Mm-hmm. And maybe, you know, make it, you know, less, I guess, distracting in terms of, you know, keeping you from doing uh, spaceship maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. That, that seems like a bad side effect there. I know. It is a bit odd that this drug seems to affect everyone to the point where they can't do basic tasks. But this is supposed to be the manufacturing center of the system. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, maybe, I, I, you know, given what we have in the episode, though, I, it just, it's kind of clear that if these planets were to actually come together and work together in, in a you know equal partnership of some sort, that they probably would have, you know, a, a post-scared city society, you know, at that point, you know, because one planet has been, you know, providing for both of them in effect. Uh, and if you just offload some of that, you know, actual useful production to the other planet, there you go. Yeah. You could remake the entire yeah. system. It'd be fine. Mm-hmm. But instead, we don't exactly. even think about it. Even Lower Decks doesn't think about it in their episode because they turn one planet into a joke and the other planet is just there. Yeah. <laughs> and being, you know, harassed by some Breen. <laughs> Which, you know, it's uh, you know always interesting to have the Breen show up because you know, they're always so mysterious. Yeah, because somebody got a hold of some rejected Star Wars outfits and... <laughs> Yes. And apparently, even if you run off with one of their their outfits after knocking them out, you don't know what they look like. Yeah. Mysterious. <laughs> anyway. Hey, I think that's a lot of what we were going to talk about with this. It's probably more than anyone yeah. expected, like we do. Surprise. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, so, uh, you know, I guess uh, maybe we should mention that, you know, if you are, uh, uh, you know, suffering from opioid addiction... Uh, reach out and uh, see if you can get some help there. I I don't have resources lined up for you, but you know there are you know various different options in different locations here. So uh, do a little bit of research and uh, good luck on getting off of that. And uh, you know if you want to take drugs, you know find something that's you know has less bad side effects for you. <laughs> and while you work on that, there's some interesting yeah. dichotomy of advice there. <laughs> yep. <laughs> while you work on all of that. It's time for the galaxy's favorite game show! Hey everybody, welcome to the game show portion of the show, where we have various contestants racking up all sorts of points in order to try to win prizes. So, uh, we got some prizes to hand out at this stage, because we're getting to the end of the episode. Hooray! And stuff. And... Um, oh yeah, prizes, man. Um, these lentils are actually pr- pretty pretty good here, get point. Anyway, uh, the the first one to hand out is the uh, the wharf maneuver, which goes to Riker, Riker, oddly enough, for getting himself shocked into paralysis to show the situation is deadly serious, sort of. What does he win, Gepwin? 
Riker wins a stunt double in a bad wig, because that is how Kirk keeps himself out of situations like this, and I think the rest of the command staff should have that too. Hmm. That sounds like a good idea, though there might be a problem with uh, one uh, person at least in terms of, you know, wigs, you know, Picard. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, uh, the second one is, uh, I'm starting to see colors here. Uh, but, and anyway, the, the second prize is, uh, the after school special, which goes to Wesley for, uh, his kind of cheesy moment learning about drug use and Tasha playing the older sibling slash teacher, teaching about the dangers of the world out there and how people get addicted to stuff. Uh, what does, uh, Wesley, uh, uh win here, Gepwin? Wesley wins, and with a mind to future times, when he has to do PSAs, he gets a button on his console that makes the, the, the more you know rainbow appear on the, on the view screen. It's like, do, 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 do. <laughs> that's, that's, that's radical, uh, uh, Gapwin. Uh, man, uh, are our engine out of alignment again, Gapwin? We're not moving, Isix. Oh. <laughs> I might explain some things, actually. Uh, the last one, I th think, is uh, the Terrible Economics Prize, which goes to the Breckians for basing their whole economy on providing other people drugs. Lucrative, yes, but the downside of for when they, you know, can't pay up or stop using the drugs is kind of terrible. Uh, not a whole lot of foresight there, and is that, a, is that an elephant over there? Can you see that gap one? Nope. Is it colors? Oh, oh. Might have colors and wings. No wings. Uh, the the colors are actually the, the background because it's just a like a drawing sort of thing. Wait, I am looking at a drawing. Anyway, uh, what do they win, Gapwin? They get to have an entire political system based on talking about how great their economic system is and blaming the Onara for not upkeeping the infrastructure, even though they don't give them any money to keep up the infrastructure. And then when it falls down, they just blame the other side even more until they all just probably die in massive food riots. Hmm. Yep, that sounds like capitalism to me. Um, yeah, so before I start hallucinating anything else here, Gepwin, uh, probably best to take us away. Uh, is that, that is you. That is you, Gepwin, right? No, this is the elephants. They're coming oh, for man. you. Oh, man. Oh, no. No, well, Isaac deals with elephants. Thank you all for dealing with this nonsense that we do called the Galaxy's Favorite Game Show. Woo! Note to self, don't eat the lentils. That's, they actually, that's what they used for the drugs. I mean, it looks like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lentils look like tiny, tiny pills, but they're way better <laughs> for you. All right, so next time, I think we should just skip this episode. No one likes it. Um, it's meaningless, and it, we're not going to have anything to say about it. So, um, <laughs> are, you, are you sure, Gepwin? I have a feeling you have a lot to say about it, actually. Yeah, I have a lot to say about the episode that's just there because one of the actors decided to leave and they had to write her out of the show. Yeah, that kind of sucks, mm, you know? Does. Hmm. But uh, I guess at least we end up on another cheap planet set? Yeah, very cheap. Yeah, kind of twice almost, really. Because <laughs> uh, there's the end bit on the, uh, the holodeck and there's like... The, you know, the, you know the, the blue skies and clouds there and, you know, like fake rocks kind of scattered about. <laughs> yep. It's just two extremely bad sets and some oil. So I guess I will give them props for working in a budget. Mm hmm. Like we're, we're trying to get rid of one of our actors because terrible things. And, uh, you know, we don't have really much money otherwise. So, yeah. But uh, but maybe maybe we can talk about I don't know the nature of evil or something like that and uh, how it's uh, you know involved with you know Roddenberry's lawyer or something. The, yeah, there's that <laughs> behind the scenes stuff. Hooray! Yeah. So of course, next episode is the infamous skin of evil, the episode mm -hmm. where they have to di get rid of an actor and there's a sledge monster. Yes, that's it. That's that's the whole thing. Yeah, uh, though I will give them props for having uh, Troy, uh, you know, contribute some, uh, you, know, you know, good parts to the plot for what there is of it. Uh, and, you know, 
that's something, yeah, I guess. It's equally depressing that this is one of the episodes where Troy has the most to do. Yeah. So that's this is going to be sad, yeah. isn't it? That's sad. It's yeah. all sad. The whole thing's sad. It was a stupid episode. It was a bad send-off for a character. The whole thing's just, just, just awful. The only good thing about it is like a two-second joke that they make in Lower Decks later. Well, uh, there is something else in that in you know, the next episode here that I do appreciate really early, but I'll talk about it then. All right. So next time, Sludge, Sludgy McSludgeface. Next time on Watchers of Tomorrow, Big Oil Attacks! You have been listening to Watchers of Tomorrow, a podcast on science fiction media. Find and follow Watchers of Tomorrow on Podbean, YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, Spreader, Digital Podcasts, and perhaps many more to come. If you enjoy our podcast, make sure to subscribe for more. And where possible, make sure to rate your experience or leave us a review. You may find Gepwin on youtube.com slash Gepwin and Twitter at Gepwin. You may find me, Dr. Isix, on youtube.com slash Dr. Isix and Twitter at IsixLP. Music is Waveform and Mori's Principle, both by DRKRN. You can also check out the Watchers of Tomorrow Discord channel. Make sure to share the experience with your friends, family, enemies, and alien overlords. If you feel you are suffering from transporter syndrome, please be aware that the next time you step off the transporter, that you, that is now, no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs>